Radio Trade. This is Don Kaufman, July 9th, 2021. Minutes to go to the cash close here on this Friday afternoon. Doing the weekend update here. Is this marketplace on the verge of some, well, wild market moves? And that's exactly what we saw in this uh, this last week of trade. Let's begin this weekend's update here at Theo Trade with a brief market update. Uh, first and foremost, no doubt about it, some wild ranges throughout the holiday trading week. So uh, four days, we're all over the place. Implied volatility is higher, it's lower. We laughed, we cried. There were some just wild and woolly moves though. So to kind of recap uh, a bit of the week, on uh, on Tuesday of this week, which of course was the first trading day of the week, and uh, what you're looking at right now is the SPX and of course the expected moves in play. The reason that I have the expected moves in play to kind of start off this weekend's update is this expected move was roughly a $42 move. That's a $42 move, higher or a $42 move lower. And I think that this is a wonderful place to actually start off in terms of a market update. And again, in terms of discussing, like, are we on the verge of some wild market moves? Evidently, the uh, the answer would be, uh, well, first and foremost, the SPX today is moving $48 higher, which is extending and exceeding, okay, any expectations that we were looking at for the entire week. So in this particular week, we will in fact end up inside the expected move. Now, for those of you that do not necessarily speak geek, that expected move is denoted by the options market. And well, in just a few minutes here, just after the uh, the cash close, we'll be able to even see the expected move, for example, for next week. Okay, we'll come back to that in just a moment. Nevertheless, the expected move this week was ripped apart. I mean, again, several times here, we actually hit the expected move effectively on Tuesday. Wednesday, we pounced right back to unchanged. Coming into Thursday, we ripped the downside of the expected move only to see us likely to finish the week, well, higher. So the point to be over here, and, and the point that I'm trying to make is, if you look at price action in the marketplace, the actual price action in the marketplace far exceeded what the option market was anticipating it to do. Again, that's what these three lines are. It's the option market's depiction of forward risk. And you know what? This is probably a pretty good time just to cruise over for just a moment right here into the uh, into the trade tab. And the reason I'm going into the trade tab is I already want to show you next week's you know, expected move. And I'm just going to tighten up the number of strikes, neither here nor there. But uh, next week, we're right now, we're portraying about a $62 expected move. Now, how does that compare to the previous week? Well, again, the previous week had a $42 expected move, but it was four trading sessions. So the um, that volatility is not exactly extreme, if you will. And that's exactly one of the points that I'm trying to make right up front. Like, if you're looking for a review of the marketplace, the biggest takeaway, okay, from this past week of trade is that, again, the option marketplace, okay, was trying to handicap much smaller moves. The moves that came were big, they were vicious. Moving forward, again, this, this next week out here, we're only looking at like a $62 move, higher or lower. And, and lo and behold, I mean, we've almost moved that today. So once again, I, I want to start off, you know, in this market kind of update telling you that, hey, look, that implied volatility in the near term, short term implied volatility looks incredibly low versus some of the price action on there. And when I talk about on the verge of kind of wild market moves, I would consider those wild market moves to be hey, it's when actual market movement is really exceeding, okay, what the option market depicted that risk to be. And uh, there's no question that moving forward, that that's a pretty clear avenue. So in this market update, again, I'm going to tell you right off the bat, we had wild ranges. I would look for those wild ranges to continue. The next aspect that really kind of resonated with me is we moved from like a wildly bifurcated marketplace. I'm going to talk about a bifurcated marketplace. We're going to look at some individual symbols here momentarily. The bifurcated marketplace, take a look at like the NASDAQ. Okay. The NASDAQ throughout the course of the week. I mean, what did the NASDAQ do effectively on Tuesday of this week? Okay. It rallied huge. If you took a look at the spiders and we're just going to drop to the spiders for a second. All right. 
What do you see in the spiders? Okay, early in the week, it actually sold off considerably. Yes, we did bounce by the uh, the day's end and finish the day. We still finished the day lower, but the the point is is that there's this wild bifurcation kind of going on in the marketplace, uh, and yet that bifurcation, okay, just it literally snapped and it like broke. And all of a sudden we were heavily correlated. And here we are with three minutes to go left in your trading week. And when I talk about bifurcation broke down into correlation, I mean, listen, the marketplace was completely and totally correlated yesterday. I mean, yesterday was like a quintessential all down day. I mean, Thursday, there's some pretty extreme selling. And then here we are seeing the exact opposite, right? But the, the takeaway from this is again, that we're in a correlated state, that everything is for the most part moving very, very cohesively, even though some of the percentage changes are off, okay, by kind of a long shot. I mean, the Russell outperforming, the NASDAQ underperforming, the S&Ps living together, dogs and cats. Um, but the, again, the key takeaway is that that marketplace happens to be correlated. When the marketplace is correlated, it is very capable, if you will, of making and treading into new ground, new territory. Um, it takes that kind of correlation coefficient. High correlation coefficients often lead okay, to breakouts and breakdowns. That's without unequivocation. And that is exactly why in this market update, okay, that's not just looking back, for instance, at last week. This is a forward-looking statement that we're saying like, hey, we're ending this week in a heavy degree of correlation. We expect that that is also going to continue into trade of effectively early next week. All right, two minutes left to play in the period. Let's start to break down some individual symbols in this market update. Now, I'm not gonna tell you anything that you haven't seen on your screen, but uh, if you missed Amazon this week, you missed it all. Amazon ultimately exploding okay, into new territory. Obviously, earnings are coming up. It's neither here nor there. One of the things, though, that really kind of caught my attention inside of uh, Amazon, and this is an area that you may have not looked at per se, it was incredible to me, okay, how much when a stock is breaking into new turf, and I'm, I'm literally going to like, you know, just highlight this for a moment and exactly what uh, what I'm actually detailing here, specifically on uh, Thinkorswim, there's under today's option statistics, and you get trade analysis, and what trade analysis happens to be, you look at things like total volume of the options traded, like everybody looks at like how many calls have traded, how many puts have actually traded, oh, look at all the calls trading versus puts, that's put call ratio, I'm sorry, but that was cool like back in like 1982, all right, push that aside. One of the things that I have tendency to look at in the first few minutes of trade, and I saw this today big time in the first few minutes of trade, traded at the bid, traded at the ask. Okay, look at the call volume, traded at the bid or traded at the ask. People, it is absolute unequivocal amateur hour inside of Amazon. This is indicative, if you will, of retail trade. And you go, how could you possibly see that? Trade at the ask or above, trade at the bid or below. You know what those are? Those are actually market orders. Those are, you know, people sitting down in their mom's basement trading, you know, Amazon, mom, me love. But the point that I'm trying to make with this, can you believe that people are using things like market orders instead of stuff like Amazon? And, you know, lo and behold, when you see this kind of activity, which is, is literally like it's a fever pitch and right at the cash open i was i was actually commenting about this today a fever pitch in here and wait wait for it here comes the closing bell then we're done for the week but um with that when you start to look at this and in the the contract size coming through right at the cash open today was phenomenal traded at the ask or above that was the specific one i was looking at what that basically meant is that traders were going out there and i'll just give you an example they were actually buying calls, okay, with uh, marketable orders, buying calls at the market, and they were actually likely putting the orders in before the cash open. So what you actually get at the cash open is an incredibly wide market. You know, a market on an option here might be like $11 normally, you know, 11 bucks by basically like, uh, we'll say like 1140, but the, uh, the bid offer spread at the cash open was like $11, okay? offered it basically like 14, you got filled at 14. And what that happened, what it caused is actually a knee-jerk reaction. The stock exploded higher and actually contracted almost immediately. And uh, this was actually a really cool one because 
you could see it play out. And uh, people thought I was, you know, like crazy. I can see literally the spikes contract, the spikes contract throughout the course of the day, though. Amazon was on, uh, you know, unable to get out of its own way. And again, it became like retail and kind of amateur hour there. And I'll tell you, uh, using a marketable order inside of a, a vicious beast like Amazon is not uh, is not going to treat you well. In fact, when you start looking at the bid offer spreads, like these are pretty formidable options to begin with. The bid offer spreads though with the cash open were substantially wider. I just wanted to cover though Amazon, not because it was, you know, breaking out to the upside. It's just the number of retail traders that are in there. And when you see things that are absolutely fever pitch going on, you know, typically that move is is over. And that's uh, it's predominantly what we saw really in that last kind of three days of trade. It started off this week with a bang. Things really mellowed out thereafter. Nevertheless, we'll keep close eyes on Amazon. I got to tell you right now, once again, in this update, I want to be a little bit of a forward looking statement and give you that uh, Amazon. I don't anticipate much out of Amazon Okay, in uh, in the very, very near future to the upside. And I want to be clear about that to the upside. I wouldn't consider much onward and upward. Let's actually cruise over to Apple. I do have a bit to say about Apple. Apple has been on an absolute tear to the upside on a percentage basis. It's effectively up 12 percent in a year to date basis. Okay, this tear to the upside, I'm going to tell you right now, for what it's worth, I wouldn't short it. I'm going to say that again. I would absolutely not short that uh, that move to the uh, to the upside. And again, I am carrying okay, some short stock positions in here and make no qualms about that. But I wouldn't step in and actually short this right now. One of the things that is apparent in here, okay, even if it, even if Apple is kind of amateur hour. Um, look at the number of calls trading in here. All right. That's just, it's shocking. 2.1 million calls traded. You realize on a day like this, we only did maybe like, you know, 40 million option contracts total, 40 million option contracts total in the whole marketplace. Apple is almost 3 million of those. Okay. Yes, traded at the uh, ask or above and the bidder below is prevalent here as well. But the bid offer spreads inside of something like Apple, which is $145 stock, are much, much tighter. And I know somebody was inevitably going to look at that. The point, though, of Apple and me bringing it up is I wouldn't stand really in front of it right now simply because the S&Ps are up about 18% on a year-to-date basis, right? The QQQ is up about close to almost 17% year-to-date basis. In fact, I'll even pull up the spiders here. Spiders are up 18%. And then you get Apple. Apple is an underperformer. And right now, you know, if you're a fund manager, all right, and you're looking to like, you know, basically game the system performance, game the system, what you're looking for is anything. Okay. What asset can I buy that is underperforming? The answer is right now, Apple's actually playing catch up. Although I think long term, Apple can be, you know, a pivotal short. Okay. In the short term over here, this is momentum trading, and I wouldn't stand in the way of it. Moving onward and upward, let's actually move over to the uh, to the financials. The financials also seeing some incredible activity. Now, before we go any further into the financials, if you are a trend trading monkey, that trend is definitely to the downside. There's no question about it. The interesting thing uh, about the financials throughout the course of this week, uh, and again, it's maybe not what you thought, and I'm not here to talk about trends so much as I am look at the breaches of expected move here again is a marketplace and i love to cover this because from a quantitative standpoint one of the most pivotal sectors inside of the s p is is the is the financials and the financials huge breach to the downside then we had a breach to the upside we have a mellow week this week we breached to the downside and then ended the week almost back to unchanged okay it is a wild wild ride inside of the financials right now and you know, the interesting thing about this is that has nothing to do with the companies themselves. It's everything to do with what I'm about to talk about in a moment, which is going to be the bond market. And I'm going to save some of the financials for that. Nevertheless, financials are coming out with earnings this next week. So earnings, you know, uh, you know, stick a fork in us. The earnings season once again is uh, is here. It'll be here. It'll be gone before you know it. But the financials, they should have stellar numbers coming into this uh, this earnings season. Why should the financials have stellar numbers? Most of the quarter, the interest rates were were rocking. Only recently did the, uh, did the rates actually come off. The amount of trading activity should have been huge. There are actually going to be loan loss provisions. The only thing is when you think about the financials, and I want you to realize this, okay, they could have stellar numbers and still sell off. Some of it may have already been priced in because just a few weeks ago, the Fed said, financials, you're allowed to buy back stock. And most of them already announced their stock buybacks. So a lot of good news is already priced into the financials. This 
It's going to be a very pivotal sector this next week. It's always a pivotal sector, but because it has earnings, okay, because it has earnings, you could actually see some scattered and kind of broken trade in here. And by the way, that's not, you know, my opinion, okay, that is predicated on looking specifically at the expected move. And I want to show you something, um, at least that I find kind of interesting when you start looking at the uh, at some of the financials here and you kind of have to exclude this 14 day option, but start looking at some of the financials and look at the expected moves. The expected move is absolutely unequivocally elevated. All right. For this next week of trade, you can kind of feel earnings, if you will, being priced in already to the uh, to the financials onward and upward from there. The energy sector. OK, when it comes down to it. Uh, the energy sector, and we're actually going to bring up uh, EEM in just a moment, but the uh, in terms of the energy sector, the energy sector looks a lot like the financials. I say this week in and week out. You know, you can comment all you want about OPEC and oil, but if you take a look at the number of breaches of expected move, the kind of trade action that you saw, okay, the only difference is the energy sector did in fact end. It ended the week underneath the expected move. So it's doing something again. This is statistically significant. The previous week, it closed inside the expected move. The week before that, outside the expected move. The week before that, way outside the expected move again. You're seeing consecutive breaches of expected move in the energy sector. You're seeing consecutive weeks of breaches of expected moves in the financials, okay? Now we're actually gonna cruise over. Before I get to the QQQ, I do wanna go to the EEM, okay? The emerging markets. The emerging markets is heavily, okay, weighted into Asia, specifically into China. Take a look at some of the wild moves in here. The point that I'm trying to make is, you know, on the verge of, of wild market moves, you're like, oh, whatever, man. We saw like four days of trade action. Actually, though, when you start looking around the marketplace, those wild moves in the market right now are not necessarily the S&Ps. The wild moves, they're everywhere. Okay, They're everywhere. And I got to tell you something about some of the wild moves that at least I'm seeing in the marketplace. It breaks to the downside. It breaks to the upside. It craters to the downside. It, you know, two, three standard deviation move to the downside inside of the emerging markets. People. Okay. There's this, this wild trade going on and we're getting this much more expansive range and you can feel it, you can taste it, you can see it, but you can't put your finger on like what the future of this is going to look like, right? Next, we come over to the QQQ because obviously the NASDAQ was pivotal this week. NASDAQ pivotal this week because this is the unstoppable force. It broke down a little bit on Thursday only to rally right back up. We are short of, uh, of all time highs. But when you like, uh, when you look at like what's called auto expected move, you know, the irony of the, uh, the NASDAQ after everything this week it's been through, it finished the week mildly higher. Kind of ironic because it finished the week mildly higher as did the S and P's finish the week mildly higher. But OK, but I'd be remiss not to mention, of course, the IWM, which is the Russell. And I brought up the Russell over here. Where did the Russell finish? OK, just hanging on like grim death to the lower edge of its expected move, not dissimilar to some of the financials out there. And uh, well, you know, what would a week be without mentioning something like Tesla? And I just wanted to bring up Tesla because here's a fairly pivotal underlying that also broke the lower edge of the expected move and came back inside of it. Earnings coming up in the very near future. All right. Onward and upward. You want to know what is really driving a lot of the trade, okay? And uh, again, this is this is gonna be for the NASDAQ, this is gonna be for the financials, the bonds. The bonds are so very back, baby, they are back in charge and driving a lot of the trade, okay? So one of the things that, that really moved markets this week is we went from fear of high interest rates, okay, a few weeks ago. And again, put this into perspective categorically. We're going from fear of high rates to, holy crap, fear of low rates. So if there's low rates, what does that do? Okay, kills the financials. That's exactly why. If there's low interest rates, and this is the 10 year, right? If there's low interest rates, it should kill the financials. But low interest rates kills the financials. Tech should love it. Would made no sense this week whatsoever is when the financials started correlating with tech. That's when you have to sit back and go, what the beep, 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 and you, you can't figure it out. The question though, is this lower rate is this going to continue? And I can tell you right now, <laughs> the the trend in the bonds is your friend. And I am not a big market technician over here, but unequivocally, okay, this looks like, and, and again, you have to kind of categorize, you know, when I say the trend is here, that trend is straight up. This is like a crash in the bond market to the upside, but the bonds crashing to the upside, what did they do today? They just, they just pulled back a little bit. They could continue to explode higher, which is 
fine with me. But if the bonds continue to explode higher, you're likely to ignite more fear about slowdown and growth. It doesn't even matter if that's true or not. Like no one cares like, oh, the growth is really slowing down in this most recent, like, listen, all that is, okay, is, is just a piece of financial like garbage news that comes out. Everybody wants a narrative to everything right now. And if the bonds continue to the upside, like people just, hey, push all that crap away. The trend right now is to the upside in the bond. That trend may reverse. I think you should pay very, very careful attention to it. You know, the interesting irony there, it doesn't matter about like whether the economy is slowing down or not. You're a trader. You need to focus like on the here and now. And the here and now, that trend is definitive. It's to the upside. You have seen, okay, wicked pullbacks before. There's some wicked pullbacks and wicked pullbacks. Even if we've got a couple more days of selling in here, these things could still explode to the upside. And if that occurs, it's going to hit the financials hard. If you hit the financials hard, you're likely to hit the S&Ps pretty hard. Okay, but right now we're also correlated, which changes everything. We're going to have a catalyst thrown in there. There's some economic data coming out this week, but specifically CPI. Be very careful. That CPI number, that, uh, that could definitely change the way you feel about the world and the markets. Let's actually snap over to, uh, to this specific uh, CPI number. It's coming out on Tuesday. So on Tuesday, it could very much uh, change the way that you feel about the bond market over there. And again, the trend is driving those bonds. So... If you're if you're watching this and we've gone through a little bit of a market update and bonds are back in charge, okay, the key takeaway for this coming week of trade is bonds are largely okay, in charge. Any rally in bonds, any rally in bonds, the marketplace as a whole is likely to get very, very nervous. You know, the FOMC minutes came out this past week. It was it was a big nothing burger, but then all of a sudden everybody they could taper maybe. Okay, but again, rates went lower this week, and uh, that was only you know what knee jerk reaction. We sell off a little bit here, but it's the bonds that you want to really watch. This should kind of resonate throughout the S and P's. So uh, again, this is the biggest mover pretty much on the screen in terms of uh, you know trend following as of late, and it has been wicked. It has been to the upside, okay? And again, as I said, that is what is going to drive trade in this next week moving forward, especially throw a little catalyst in there like a hand grenade, like CPI, okay? And you could get some explosive, explosive movement in the bonds, especially if CPI, like people are thinking, oh no, inflation is here. Yeah, what if the CPI number comes in a little weak? All of a sudden, it's slowing growth and the bonds could explode to the upside. Look to the dark side, people. Bonds, again, are trading to the upside. Last but definitely not least, as we do each and every week over here, we discuss a little bit about expected move. Expected move, again, as it pertains to the SPX. And I just can't help but mention this again. The expected move for all of this past week of trade was $42. That's it. So what did we do? Did we move more than $42? Yeah, to the downside, then we rallied back. We closed inside of expected move. We had three previous weeks. Again, three previous weeks. Breach, breach, breach of expected move. We told you that this week was going to be a wild and woolly week. I'm telling you right now, it's actually going to continue. Next week, what is the approximate expected move? Now, this expected move for next week is just settling down right now. We said a few moments ago, it's probably going to be about 62 bucks. Here we go. We're kind of keying into this about $61 and change. So even after we saw, you know, ridiculously, what this was almost a 70 point move to the downside. Today, we have a almost a 50 point move to the upside. Next week, the entire week, we're only expecting a $61 move. Yeah. Do you hear the question mark in that voice? That's because, yeah, I got more questions than answers on that particular front. Uh, short duration implied volatility is just dead. Okay. Do not sell stuff in the short duration. If you're going to sell some premium, back month volatility is where it's at. Back month volatility is 20%. Short duration volatility, look at the 6%, 10%, 12%. It is dead, people. Keep that in mind throughout the course of this uh, next week of trade. And once again, okay, we very much are on the verge of some, you know, some wild market moves. You're seeing it in all of the different sectors. You're seeing it in some of the some of the marquee stocks out there. Okay. Likely to see it. Uh, kind of evolve in the S&Ps themselves. Thanks, everybody, for joining us here at Theo Trade. Have a wonderful weekend. Bye-bye.